can you can you do a recap of where we left off real quick? Uh, yeah. All right. So here we are at the fledgling discussion number three. We're going to talk about fledgling probably, and maybe do a little bit of game dev, and maybe do a little bit of some of this and some of that. Who knows what's going to happen? It'll be an adventure, a learning adventure. I am Paul Spooner. This is my brother Luke Spooner, and we are in our morning routine. And uh, we're going to just talk a bit because this is never going to get done do if have... we don't do it in the middle of other things. I have I have children in the background, which makes this a little exciting. So I also have uh, children in the background, although I've shut the door and asked them to leave me alone. So maybe that will work. Maybe. All right. Okay, so we were talking about um, kind of uh, top-down versus bottom-up uh, methodology for constructing... Um, fledgling engine. Um, I had some more thoughts on this regarding, mm. like, um, uh, mostly my thoughts are around, uh, like, the user experience and then, like, trying to talk through what do we want the user experience to be like. Yeah. And there's there's actually there's actually two there's two layers of users because really what we're trying to build is we're trying to build a tool set. So we have. Uh, a user experience of the people using the tools, and we have user experience of a gamer playing a game. Mm, okay, right. And I, like, I want to make sure. Well, I don't want to make sure, but I think it might be useful to talk through what we imagine and that we're having the same objective. And then once we have established the same objective, then we can kind of back up and start talking again about optimal ways to design said experience and how can we give that to our how can we build the tool from there because um, i think i got a little ahead of myself with trying to argue for some methodology when i realized it's like oh i'm not i'm not in positive work i had envisioned the same tool mm. so uh, do you want to take a crack at describing how you imagine fledgling once it's made being used <laughs> by a designer yeah all right so i um let's see I feel like the designer and the player experience is going to be very similar. Uh, or, or at least I'm, I'm kind of hoping for that. I'm kind of, um, the, the way I'm envisioning is that the player will be um, using all the tools that fledgling has to shape the way that f the fledgling engine is thinking about the world that it's simulating and if they want to if they want to do that by changing the characters in the game then it'll be kind of like playing a normal game but you could also do it by changing the world in which it would be more like a level editor or you could do it by changing the mechanics in which case it would be more like a game dev role um so I guess I think of it more Do you like... imagine giving mechanic... So I saw those as siloed into two different ways of interfacing with a fledgling engine. One is uh, changing mechanics, which is what we're talking about with like... I, I imagine that as like the module-based thing that that would take some coding and a little bit of work to get the things oh. massaged together. Mm. Um, and the other one would be um, more uh, messing inside the modules with the levers that are exposed and the games that expose on the far side. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like that is probably a, uh, a, a, a very likely step on the way to the final thing. Um, in my mind, the, the final gameplay doesn't make a distinction between those two things. It's, it's all, it's all one experience, but very likely. Yes. There will be a, a stage in there where instead of, uh, instead of a continuous spectrum of interaction, there is a, a distinct phase change there where you're dealing with inside existing modules or dealing with making modules for other people to, or, or even yourself to play with. <laughs> so I've got, while you're uh, not able to speak, I've got a little uh, program that I wrote this last week, I was playing Before We Leave, and uh, 
that's a like a city builder kind of game. And so I made a little, I didn't actually write the program last week. I, I just used it because this is the universal architect calculation program. And it is a thing for doing nested node calculations and recursive, uh, recursive calculations and stuff. So I've got here, like, um, not all the, the buildings in before we leave, but I've got a number of the buildings in before we leave. So here's like, uh, and you can't see this Luke, but you'll be able to watch it later. <laughs> and, and you, you're familiar with this, I think. So there's uh, I like, haven't actually seen it. I might have to oh, Google it, but no, I'm okay. talking on my phone. So yeah. All right. All right. Well, so, so there's, um, basically what it does is it's got, uh, <laughs> the file format is conformable so that you can change the way that it's annotated, which I'm not certain why I did that, but I decided to do that. So, uh, you can go to joints.org.com.com, dot com, I think. Johunts.org slash universal architect. And uh, UACalc 0.2.py and specification.txt are the ones that you need. And the other ones are uh, example programs. So you go to juntz.org. It's a little uh, right up there at the top, Projects Universal Architect. So uh, it, it basically takes any node that has only draw so only negative resource production and it calculates it out into its own node so if we wanted to like real quick uh make a node that does um that makes uh oil derrick that's like tell me what i need to run two oil derricks so we'd say like oil outpost this it seems a lot like the satisfactory spreadsheets that you and Drew are working on. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, similar. I I'm not uh, I'm not certain what all the satisfactory. Oh no, okay, yeah. So satisfactory has uh, has some of this stuff. The thing that makes before we leave so perfect for this kind of calculation is that it is. Uh, it requires peeps to do labor, the, the, the your little meeples, basically. Right. And the meeples require food, and the food requires meeples to do work in the fields. And so you get this recursive problem of, like, how many meeples do I need? And so this ah. just solves that problem. It's, it's, this, is, this is what it was designed for, for recursive problems like that. Uh, it was actually designed for um, doing calculations for, like, spaceships where you've got fuel and you've got engines and then to carry more fuel you need more engines and then like you've got right. people that do stuff and then like to take care of the people you need more people and so there's like two levels of recursive calculation that you need to do um got it i mean i would love to talk about space wheat again someday i i feel like space wheat is so close to some of my favorite things that we want fledgling to have and that's that's around the last time we talked about the uh, spaceship calculator was for that and the procedural generation there, right? Yeah. So here I just ran the the oil well thing where you need two oil wells, and the oil well thing will generate twelve oil. It takes nineteen tiles. It uses eight peeps, and they've got sixteen drinks and sixteen food, and you need one power. You've got one power extra. Uh, and so then down here, you can see all the nodes that it needed. All local nodes and resources are as follows. Two oil wells, two rows of huts, or a row of two huts, one row of two huts, a well, three uncultivated potato fields, um, a wood generator with only one person working at it, a wood cutter with only one person working at it, and one hut all by itself. And that'll give you full production on two oil wells. So that's the kind of thing you can do. Uh, Got it. And then it saves that as a text file. And that text file is its own node. So you can copy and paste that back into the specification file if you want. And now that'll act as its own node. 
generating resources and stuff. So you can just say like, oh, well, just I'll just build one oil outpost. And then all of that stuff is abstracted away inside of the oil outpost. I see. Okay. And you, uh, you've you talked a lot about um, giving tools of abstraction to your users, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a, is a core... It's a core design in a lot of the things that you imagine playing. Um, and I, I don't have the same, I, I, I don't have the same intuition for how things can be abstracted and maintain information. And you and I talk about this frequently, which is where I actually thinking about that problem is where I came up with the kind of emergent uh, mountain from stones is like, well, here's how we can create the abstracted information procedurally. Yeah. Uh. And then you often talk about uh, allowing, but in this case, you're actually allowing the user, you would expose the tools to the user and the users get to do their own type of abstraction. Right. Which is uh, like a, as a gameplay mechanic, I never really thought it was like, how can you, how can you abstract this information is, uh, I don't know if I've ever seen that done. Well, it happens in Factorio uh, because you can take a whole block of factories and and make them a template, and then you plop that down, and you're basically building one mega factory with certain inputs and certain outputs, and you don't have to think about the interiors anymore. Mm, I suppose that's true. So it would be nice if Factorio actually made that a mechanic of like the mega factory, and instead of building all those individual buildings, you just at actually abstract them into a thing and then you don't look at it anymore. Uh, it happens in right, industry like where you can build a factory and, you know, build this whole base on the planet and it's on one of those map tiles. And then you can tell it to export stuff and it just does. And then you don't have to look inside that tile anymore. It just works without, you know, without any, any kind of oversight. And so you right. can go off and do something else. And it doesn't, I don't think it even simulates what's happening inside there anymore. It just has like, this thing exports so much stuff per minute and, and that's it. And I think you can game that by like building a huge stockpile of stuff and then exporting it all at once for a short amount of time and then closing the map and never looking at it again. And it'll be like, wow, you're just generating a ton of stuff. I, I don't know for certain if that's what it does. I think it does do some simulation in the background. But um, but anyway, I know I know Civil is uh, SimCity Four. Mm. Uh, that was definitely like the GTO. Uh, wait, GOT? Well, I don't know. Game optimal theory. Game yeah. theory optimal solution was um, you have a like a, a dump and you have one place that receives all the trash. Oh sure. And then you just never open it. It never <laughs> recalculates how much trash is in there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So we'd, we'd want Fledgling to be smart about how it allowed you to use abstraction. but that, That's the question, of course, yeah. right? It's like, is that a feature? Do we want... Is, is it a bug? A well, I mean, like, if, the idea is that it's, it's open to an uh, adjustment by the user. So if you want it to work that way, you can make it work that way. Oh, man, that's, that's all... See, at, at some point, I feel like we're making unity and then people don't actually want to sit down and use unity as a game. Well, some people do like Seamus Young does. Seamus Young plays unity by like, Oh, I've got this game idea. I'm going to try it out and like sits down and like for fun makes a little game. So <laughs> got it. Well, this is this is kind of what I was talking about. Like, uh, I'm interested in fledgling at different layers, and yeah. I'm interested in, of course, as a designer, as we just described, Seamus Young probably also is the same kind of interest. But I'm also interested in designing it for users that have no interest in being a designer. Mm. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah, and and it should be it should be playable at that level. I mean, it, kind of. So. Okay, so here's here's one aspect that uh, could spark some discussion. When you're playing a platformer, you're basically like remote controlling a little character and like 
you press the jump button and you press the right and left bounce button and it moves. It doesn't really move like a character would. Like a real person doing parkour wouldn't move like that. They wouldn't like run up and then like, you know, jump almost at the edge. They would run up and jump exactly at the edge because their whole body is integrated with the goal that they're trying to achieve. Like um, I always, I always, it always annoyed me that um, people rarely use the, uh, what is it? The Tomb Raider, the Tomb Raider jump system where like you, in the first Tomb Raider, I don't know if they did in subsequent games where you run right up to the edge of a, of a cliff. And if you hold down the jump button, you'll jump right at the edge. It, it doesn't require oh, you to do oh, that cool. timing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, that's how real people do things. Like if I'm, if I'm going to try to time my stride, I just do it. Like, I don't have to think about it. I don't have to like jump exactly at the right moment. I just tell my body jump at the edge and it does. So, so I like things like that. So, so there's that level of like execution automation, basically where in fledgling, you wouldn't have to say, jump right at this instant you could say jump at this location or even i'm trying to get over there can you do that and then your character's confidence plays into it right like your character might be able to do it but they might not have the confidence to to be sure that they're going to do it so then you can do things like practice not to get your skill higher but to get your confidence in your skill higher which a lot of times is actually what's happening in real life so uh, if we're talking about, oh man, okay. <laughs> so so uh, let's take uh, I, my mind goes to Fire Emblem and in uh, puzzle game and basically, but it's a combat and then you roll dice and you try and attack each other and your skills go up and down and mm. there's often this thing where you're you're playing a game against uh, it's a, basically a gambling game where you have some amount of uh, something tragic has happened with a banana. Oh, no. Um, uh, but you're playing a game against, like, uh, I have a 50% chance. That's not good enough. What can I do? I can use a different character. I can use a different weapon. I can attack from a different location, right? Something like this. So mm-hmm. you're, you're, like, you're, you're, you're trying to modify the odds with the tools you have available. Mm-hmm. And you could say, like, oh, I want to jump across this gap, but I have, like, 50% confidence that's going to happen. And you can modify your confidence with practice to make you more confident, or you can make yourself stronger, or you can, like, a bunch of different tools to modify that same kind of probability, and then you roll the dice. Right. Right. In, it's in a, it's a, a normal game, it would be like that. I feel like, I feel like the whole probability thing is a ruse in games because like if if you have a sensible okay so so what happens is people put in probability stuff because it's fun and people like gambling and so then you have a probability system but then because you have a probability system you can game it with save games and so because you have a probability system you don't want to take that out because people find it fun you take the save system out or make it checkpoint based or make it uh difficult to use in some way or make it punishing or, you know, make reloading take really long time so that people are disincentivized to game the system. Whereas really what I think you should do is make it super easy to game the system and take out the, the, the mechanics that require you to engage with the the odds with the, the gambling part. So, so like in, like in super Mario brothers, there's, no gambling system. There's no odds of stuff. You you can either make right. the jump or not. You can either jump on the guy's head or not. Like it's it's deterministic. And there are um, there's strategy games. What is that? Uh, there's this turn-based strategy game. Oh, oh, well, like um, like Frozen Synapse has no no pr- um, probability system in it. It's all deterministic. You're either right. going to shoot the guy before he shoots you, or you, sh- or he shoots you before you know. But they, one or the they other. give you the feeling of gambling anyway because they use hidden information. Hidden information, so right? Because, right, right. It's a different which you can also, if you're playing a game that was not multiplayer, um, because in Frozen Synapse there's no saving. Right. Play multiplayer. Um, so if that were that, uh, you end up having the same problem. Or maybe it's not a problem. Do you... oh, I see. So you're saying 
you would rather have the design more like frozen synapse with a fully deterministic method that you can then kind of game around. And if you want to, you can turn on and off the ability to save, which is basically magic and discontinuity. Uh, well, I mean, saving is, is basically a level editor or like a, a play, a playthrough editor. It's like, it's like saying, here's my perfect playthrough. I want it to go like this. And my feeling is if you have an idea of a perfect playthrough, you should be able to make it happen. And I like the game should allow you to make it happen in a way that's so, non-obstructive and, and not, un, not unnecessarily obstructive. So a fledgling platformer would end up looking like a tool assisted speed run. Yeah. Yeah. Or you, you, you hand the tools to the players. Right. Well, so, so like a, a fledgling platformer in my mind, isn't about like holding the right or left D pad and pushing the jump button. It's about crafting a pathway through a complex space or even crafting a character that can navigate a complex space. It's more like creating an AI than it is like, or more like creating a TAS than it is like actually performing a speed run yourself. If that makes sense. Right. So like, so sense. like in, in a, yeah, it, like uh, what's the, I'm trying to think there's a game that's, um, that's a platformer, but you tell your characters, it's got like pathfinding and stuff. And so you tell your characters what to do and they like navigate the space themselves. Um, I can't think of the name of it. I mean, almost but every RTS been... has, you know, pathfinding or something. Sure, sure. But if you could imagine, like, uh, a Mega Man game where instead of, like, holding down the button and pressing jump, you are um, prioritizing targets and uh, saying which boss to attack first, right? Because, the, you know, there's that whole thing of, like, this boss's weapon is good against this boss and this boss's weapon is good against this boss. And, like, which one do you attack right. first? So you can break into that cycle and then like, you know, get into that thing. Um, but so, instead of it being predetermined, which boss is good against which boss, it's all proc gen at the beginning. So you do some investigation into, you know, spend some time investigating which of these bosses weapons is good against the other bosses or whatever, or maybe like scout or like get a low level weapon and, or like develop low level weapons of the elemental type and then try them out and then go and capture the boss. Right. Like there'd be all these things that you can do other than just like doing the platforming part. And then if you wanted to, you could say, show me what you're doing when you're doing this platforming and it'll show you. Or if you wanted to, you could actually do it yourself, but like you can abstract all that away and say like, well, I just go from place A to place B and it's like, okay, you use up so much ammo and so much energy going from here to there. Right. So, uh, two two thoughts. One is a gratuitous space battles, which we've both played. Yes. Um, and there's a lot. Uh, this sounds a lot like that, where you have all the tooling and all the kind of the AI, and you can put in scripts and behaviors, and you can load and save templates, and then you're trying to fight certain battles, but you can't actually steer anybody. Hmm. Um. Right. And I would like it, I would like one... it to be like that, except that you actually can, like there, there is actually all that detail under the hood if you want it and you can open up a ship and see where all the people are like in FTL, right? Like a game like FTL, but then you can zoom out and it's gratuitous space battles, but then you can zoom out and it's uh, Stellaris Shogun or whatever. Or yeah. Okay. So Shogun is the other one that I was thinking of, which is why I jumped the gun on it, but, um, it... They have the, uh, you can fight, and then you also have an auto battle. And it's just notorious that, like, the auto battle is, is very skeptical of your abilities as a general. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, and the same it, thing with... It really um... doesn't simulate a battle and then figure out how it goes. It just, like, matches up in some separate form of mechanics, I presume. Right, right. And it's always frustrating, because, like, there's a bunch of times... The, the one time I beat Shogun 2... Uh, I just, I played with archers and like, it was always the same strategy. It was like, if I'm on defense, which I pretty much always fought in defense, I would just like put all my archers on a hill and put all my pikemen 
in a line in front of them. And then the, the computers would mull around until they were almost out of time. And then all of their guys were exhausted. And then they come over, attack me, and they shoot them with arrows until they route. And it's like, I, I never, I, I think I lost a total of two, two units in an entire campaign. It was absurd. Just like clean sweep. Right, and, right. But if I ever use auto battle, I just like lose 20% of my army. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so I uh I had the same feeling with an earlier game. Uh I forget the name of it, but it was a, a medieval game and you build castles and uh Lords of the you Round. can do a siege uh Knights of the Round as a Wait. summon in Final Fantasy 7. No, no. Uh, Lords Lords of the Realm 2. Lords of the Realm. The yes. Yes. Yeah, with the macemen and the crossbows, and the the arrows would fly slow enough that you could like you could dodge them, them and the stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like, if you were playing it and you you really you really gamed it hard, you could take the highest level castle and lose like three or four guys. But if you didn't, right. then it was basically impossible. If you use the auto calc, it's basically impossible to take a highest level castle because it would just kill all your guys. It'd be like, well, you can't do it. No one can. So. Uh, so I had the same feeling about, about that. And I think the, obviously because fledgling is the perfect game, it's going to be able to handle it perfectly, but, uh, oh man, there's gotta be a way for you to see my video. This is really annoying. Okay. But anyway, um, my, my approach, my idea for the approach in fledgling is that fledgling will learn about the ways that the things in the world perform based on the actual performance and not based on some model that it has of what's going on. So if you're uh, Ender Wiggins from Ender's Game and you demonstrate in the simulator that you can do all these amazing things and like win all these battles, then you should be able to say, well, okay, we'll just like auto calc this one and it should use your previous performance to demonstrate, to, to use the, do the calculation on your previous performance, not on whatever model existed before you started playing the game. Okay. So I'm, I'm seeing an immediate problem mm -hmm. from my experiences of like, uh, board games. So I like playing Dominion, the, the card game where you build a little engine and I really like engine building mechanics in general. Um, and what happens is let's say you have 10 cards and then you have to construct, you basically are real time drafting up a deck to perform, it's an economics engine to generate money to buy victory points. Mm -hmm. And it's all about timing your engine so that way you get the right amount. And then as you buy victory points, it clogs your engine. So you have a performance curve that looks like this. And mm -hmm. it's all about trying to time it so you end up getting all your points and then you, you clog up your deck and then the game ends as opposed to waiting too long and you never get to buy everything or buying too early and then it kind of clogs up. So it's all about this timing against the other players and then it's very RNG heavy. Sure. Okay, so sure. Oh, it's a fun game. Um, but the uh, the problem is that games I, I generally lose. The problem is you generally lose. <laughs> when I win, I just trounce everybody. Hmm. Because it's it's what I'm after is trying to craft an engine that has a runaway effect. That just by the end, I just like every I, one turn, I buy half the available points. And then the second turn, I buy the rest of the points. And if I can get that to trigger before everyone else is ready to start acquiring points, then I, I trounce everyone. Mm. And I don't know how I would even imagine to train an AI to look at the 10 cards and see the edge case that can produce this ed runaway engine. Right, right. Well, so maybe, maybe so we the, could. But I mean, I, the, well, the first thing is that it's heavy RNG, which is difficult to simulate, right? Because that you have to do ten thousand runs in order to get a good sample. Right. Um, and that's yeah. I I but, don't know how to I don't know how to solve imagine, the RNG problem. Well, let's imagine a. You could imagine a, a, a very different game that has the same problem that I experienced, which is like a, I can't think of a good one off the top of my head, but like a, like a, I don't know, Century Spice Road has a much smaller RNG. Sure. Well, you could I could, I could imagine, okay, so I could imagine Dominion, um, but instead of being turn-based, it's got variable turn length, and the length of your turn is based on the size of your deck. 
So if you've got uh, a card, you've got like 10 cards in your deck, then it takes 10 time units to take your turn. And then you get to play, you know, however many cards that your draw side it, size is. So then your turns are much longer than the other player's turns. And so then there's no RNG, right? You get to draw, you get to draft from your whole deck, but the size of your deck determines how long your turns are. And so then there would be no, um, in fact, you could probably prototype this in real life, just like playing Dominion. But I don't know, maybe, sure. you, maybe you'd like to do that. And, but in that case, there's no RNG, right? You, there's no randomness. You get to choose from your whole deck, but the length of your turn is variable. So other people get to take five turns and you only get to take three or something like that. Um, and that way you can, that way you can just, you can demonstrate your optimal strategy while still having the trade-offs of the time, the time spent. It, it just takes a little bit more accounting. But for a computer, it wouldn't be a problem, right? It would be easy for a computer to do that accounting. Right. So in this imaginary game, if it was a fledgling game, um, are we, like... Oh, so so this, game, this game is basically oh, no. Gerbil Journey. Uh, is Gerbil Journey on the, on the chart? Uh, yeah, I believe it is, near the bottom. Um, because this is basically Gerbil Journey. It's like runaway engine building pitted against optimal performance. Let me pull it up. Let's see. Uh, Project Fledgling. Yeah, it is. Gerbil Journey. I don't even know my own chart. All right, here we go. Let's see. Let's pull this up here. So you're right. It is down near the bottom. So Dribble Journey is basically um, Team A is perfect information and runaway engine building. And Team B is low overhead and optimal play, but not perfect information. Uh, so you would be... My idea is that you would be playing on the side of the gerbils, but you could play on the side of the replicating machines. And so, so the replicating machines don't have perfect information. They're dealing with only speed of light information transfer. And so they're trying to like colonize the stars. It's a basic like, you know, um, runaway uh, gray goo kind of thing, right? Where it's like, oh, you gotta build these factories to build these spaceships to transport your spores over to other star systems. So you can build more factories and, you know, just like run away and take over everything. Um, and then on the right. other side is the gerbils who have, who are like, um, <laughs> what is it? They're basically psychic hamsters. Like time, they're not time traveling, but they're time communicating. They can communicate back in time. And so, uh, right. and they're paired with this, uh, like machine intelligence, but it's not a, um, it's not a runaway intelligence. It's just trying to take care of the hamsters. It's not trying to achieve its own goals. So it's like a selfless, AI versus a selfish AI, maybe. Um, and the the idea is that you have your gerbils and then you can like breed them to have different qualities so that you can have different bands on which to transfer psychic information because the psychic information can only be transferred between gerbils of a of like a, of a certain strain. And so like, mm. but then they all, but the channel gets used up when you use it kind of. So like, Anyway, and so so you've got the ability to trans uh, to transmit information back in time, and so then you've got it's this whole like time game where you've got a factory somewhere or like a big base of some kind that you're building up, but the real game is to get your hamsters out to other locations so that they can scout out what the enemy is doing, and um, figure out exactly the like the weakness. It's like a it's like a power it's like a power gamer kind of game where you're trying to or not even Power Gamer, it's like, what is it? Exploit. It's like an exploit game where you're trying to find the exploit in the AI, the, the, the enemy AI, like taking the castle with only two losses or, or fighting the enemy army with only a couple losses, right? 
it's that idea of like find the exploit that you can use to just like put this wrench in the works of the enemy so that everything falls apart and then transmit transmit that information back in time actually build the exploit on your planet and actually transmit the inf the exploit to the location so that it shows up right after you scout it out or build it on some other planet somewhere else and 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 transmit yeah. it so that it actually gets there but then your production ends up getting used up over time so you've got to build more bases so there's this temporal management of like do i build a colony ship to build another base or do i build this exploit to conquer this system and then the enemy is always um uh, changing the way that they're working they're always evolving so that the exploits don't always work so you have to keep scouting things out to find the exploits and you have to exploit them as quickly as possible before they change so uh so the idea would be like getting the timing right for like okay i've got this production chain and i want to Maybe I want to build a faster ship so that I can get there faster, so that I can have longer time to develop the exploit or whatever it is. Right. So anyway, that's that's Gerbil Journey um, in a nutshell. And I, I don't think I've written an article about it yet. Or maybe I have. But anyway, the... Uh, we talked about it a few times. Yeah. Yeah, let me just... But I, I don't... No, I think you did. I think you did write one. Corridor Gerbil corridor. Journey. Yeah, yeah, it is. There it is. Yeah. So anyway, so that's the um, that's the whole like temporal uh, engine building uh, engine building variable turn length. Because basically, your whole turn is like you get a certain amount of a window of time in which to deliver an exploit once you've scouted out the exploit, and like how do you approach that? What's the optimal way to approach it? is that right but that's the game the time is is measured in a very weird way there because you would just you know run your production up over here you could basically i'm imagining you're playing this game with like a slider that's like yeah yeah down. you can slide through time and you're like oh okay i can see where it's developing here and it's just all the information you have available and then as you advance and then find more information you can slide around differently yeah well and, so that would be that would be the planning tool that would be the planning tool because you should be able to plan out your strategy, right? Like, okay, well, here's my plan. I'm going to do this and this and this. I'm going to develop this thing and it's going to run away and I'm going to do this thing, right? And so that's your plan. But then you have to st actually start executing. And as you start executing it, more information will come in at certain points, right? Like your scout actually arrives or, uh, you know, you send out another scout and that one arrives somewhere else. And now you've got more information. And so now you need to rethink your plan. And so there would be like, you'd say, you'd plan out the whole thing. You'd say, okay, advance to the next, uh, whatever stopping point is. And then you get to another stopping point where you get new information or something breaks down, or you actually get attacked at your current location. You've got to fend off an attack of some kind or whatever it is. Right. So yeah, you'd be scrubbing in the, in the planning tool, but you wouldn't be able to go back. You wouldn't actually be able to go back in time in the, in the execution of the game. I mean, unless you reload it right. and save, which is something you could do. But when you reload, then it changes all the all the um, events that are going to happen in the future, right? So, so you don't get to you don't get to power game it, right. or so, scum uh, save it. You don't get to scum save it. Go ahead. So if we if we can go, um, I'm imagining that if every because uh, you're affecting the past, and your planning tool is also going to be your history. Yeah. Well, it, it could be, yeah. Because I'm like, let's say we, we, you get to a certain point in gameplay in, in real time where you send your information about how to build this base back in time to your gerbil over there. Mm -hmm. Have I don't know, maybe, maybe your gerbils have um, their own gray goo type thing that can self-replicate and behave normally and like one of them's run away and it's like okay well here take the rocks and put this together and build this factory out of nothing and, and now you have a, a counter a counterpoint running or something i don't know actually know what the, the tools you yeah. plan to give the dribbles yeah so so I imagine my idea like my idea would be that you've got um for for that aspect of the temporal stuff any any message that you send or, or any any uh, message that you're planning to send, any scout that you send out that you're planning to send a message back in time, you play that one first up to the point where you send the message. 
and then you play that scout and the and the base timeline simultaneously so they're they're basically synced up but there's an offset in space time between their locations if that oh makes i sense. see so you'd be playing you, you send out a scout and then you send out a uh, you know you've got an offset in space time so you can use up that offset at your base location but you can't advance the you can't advance the scout in time without also advancing the in, increasing the gap basically right and then whatever happens to the scout is is solidified you can't go back and change the scout's history so you know the scout arrives uh and then any scouting you do you can't change that history you know you build up some some amount of history of the scout actually doing things and then you send your message back in time now you've got a an, a certain gap between the two and then you can keep doing the scout keep doing stuff if you want or you can use up that that um budget of, of space time it's basically it gives you a space time budget right of like how much space time do you have between these two things and so you could use that whole thing up and deliver like a whole fleet right to the scout and then use that fleet from there and like you know build something or you could start building something with a scout whatever maybe send another message uh I, i'm not sure exactly how the mechanics will work there but you know like do something do some experiments on the ai to see how it behaves uh you know send another message back in time now there's now you've got to use up before you send the message back in time you have to use up the buffer between the first message and the second message so back at your base at your base timeline uh you have to use up that buffer before you can receive the message so i guess you would have to advance both timelines in synchronicity let's be right back go ahead cedric is getting in my toolbox oh no Corridor, Gerbil Journey. I'll just read this while Luke's away. This is a game about procedurally generating corridors. You're playing as a cute little rodent of some sort. Let's call it a gerbil. The progression path is to prove yourself worthy of the throne of the intergalactic gerbil emperor. But it's a sandbox game, so you're free to get distracted. I'll be describing the progression from the bottom up, but you can start anywhere in the progression. The game will fill the previous steps procedurally. In fact, the progression path is the first corridor, and the corridor personal empowerment through increasing authority and responsibility. The core themes. The game themes are structured around three animal virtues, food, sleep security, and reproduction. For you to ascend to a burrow leader, you must master the basics of the three gerbil virtues. And when applied to gerbils, these become foraging, burrowing, and mating. To master foraging, you must master the knowledge of plants. The three virtues applied to plants are leaves, roots, stalks, roots, and seeds, and seeds. To master burrowing, you must master the knowledge of predators. The three virtues applied to predators are hunting and ferocity, nesting ferocity, and nesting eggs instruction ferocity. And to master mating, you must master the knowledge of rodents, thereby becoming a burrow leader. Thus, mating is the meta virtue, that of reflexive knowledge of self awareness. Once you are a burrow leader, you can begin applying your knowledge of the nine virtues, three of each for e gerbils, plants, and predators, to the actions and administrations of your AI robot partners. Oh, I didn't mention that. The whole game takes place in the context of a spacefaring cybernetic society of gerbils and robots. The backstory is, of course, procedurally generated. Anything from a regressed post singularity society to an intentional self replicating biomechanical weapon. And the point is that you can start in an arbitrary position of authority in the context of an arbitrary extension, arbitrarily ancient, arbitrarily powerful society of self replicating machines and self replicating cute, fluffy critters. The three virtues, of course, apply to the robots as well, and they can take on the aspect of gerbils and plants and predators, and the three robot virtues are mining, power, and reclamation, tunnel, infrastructure, and spires, and repurposing, tooling, and calibration. So as a burrow leader, you may apply your mastery of the nine virtues to the robots who will obey you to the degree that you have earned their authority, and as you progress in mastering virtues, you unlock access to more powerful tools. For now, I'm thinking that a way to master a virtue is to build an artifact, a vessel, construction, etc., can measure it to your current mastery level, which is an excellent example of the virtue in question, but I'm not quite clear how all this works at present. If you have any suggestions, leave a comment. The mastery levels. The mastery level is the number of virtues you have mastered and the maximum command level or the capability unlocked. Zero, the zero level, personal freedom and suggestion. At first, you simply have the freedom to roam around as a gerbil. You can open doors by pushing buttons and you can come... If you come to a door that doesn't lead anywhere, you can make a suggestion for what the robot should build there. Probably there are several buttons there with icons for what things they can build. You push them with your cute little nose, or maybe your paw, and you can tell them what kind of corridors to build. Corridors. Once you suggest a group of spaces that work well together to some use for a purpose, you will move to level one, the artifact. You can request and design tools, clothes, and equipment. 
You can also give instructions to individual small robots, and this allows you to tinker with artifacts and repair machinery. Level 2, vessels or vehicles. You can request and design mobile vehicles, transports, etc. You get a vehicle of your own as well, which allows you to travel much more quickly, and as a vehicle is basically a large robot or a large tool, you can modify buildings. Level 3, base and the implant. Authority over buildings, installations, and cities, etc. At this stage, you gain access to a cybernetic implant, which allows you direct communication with the robots, including a data overlay. These first three levels are essentially locally focused, but the third level of mastery, you can control completely your bodily, physical environment. Level four, continent and the psych chamber. Your authority can now encompass many cities, and at this stage, you've probably acquired enough resources to access space, and your strategic choices will begin to have an impact on the empire. But how do you hold a conversation with others who are light years away? And why do the robots keep gerbils around anyway? Well, it's because they have psychic communication abilities, and this psychic sense has strict requirements. Two similar gerbils need to match very closely in an environment, hence a very specific environment chamber. And the chamber has nine positions in it, which are individual channels of precision communication. Oh, I didn't mention that part. The psychic communication can be across arbitrarily gaps of time as well as arbitrary distances. So this is basically your long-term quest system. Gerbils from the future will call for help, and you can concentrate your efforts, or you can probably get there in time to give them aid. Or if you need to do something for yourself, you can send out your own psychic request, and perhaps someone out there will send you help. Oh, and one of your channels is reserved for communication with the intergalactic gerbil emperor. You probably should pay attention to him if you want to advance any further in the rank. And it goes on. So, Luke, you've read this before. I was just reading uh, mm -hmm. the gerbil journey blog post. It focuses a lot more on the progression, mm -hmm. like the single player, normal gamer kind of type of progression, getting up to uh, the the higher levels of uh, chrono jumps. Yeah, the higher levels of um, game stuff, but uh, it's the same. It's the same game basically. We were talking about the the chronotemporal spatial mechanics, right. and I think what you need to do is once you send a message, you, you, once you send a scout, you need to play the scout until you send a message. Once you send a message, in order to advance time for either of the uh, locations, you need to advance both of them simultaneously so that the gap stays the same and so that you're never acting on information that you couldn't have had access to. Uh, so like, you know, you, you advance time for an hour in the scout, time advances for an hour at the main base, and then you could send another message back and now the main base has the information that you have from the scout, right? Okay, so you have this uh, environment chamber that allows you to make a psychic connection. Yeah. What if you just had it, so you go out, you have your scout, and your scout, you hit the button, and you're like, okay, I need to establish a link. But it's not determined whether, like, you, you send that message back to the gerbils, but that doesn't necessarily mean they can receive your message, because they might not have the proper environment chamber. Yeah, yeah, right? true. So then, like, you snap back over, and then you take as much time, which is going to, like again, create this time di uh, time offset, I think is what you call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Until you can... Budget. Use up some of your budget. Proper... Yeah. So you can construct the chamber. So then you also want to have like a whole meta game of getting chamber construction really optimized. So you have a small offset. Then yeah. you have to get a gerbil to match the signal of the scout, which you should already know because that scout left in the past. So you should have all the right. information you need. Well, so it's like yeah. you need to maintain someone available to receive the message. Right, right. And or multiple multiple the... strains of gerbils in order to receive messages from other outposts that maybe you didn't have interaction with. Right. Oh, I see. Got it. The, the idea that and I then... had was that it, instead of instead of you sending out scouts initially, you would build the psych chamber and then just like wait there. It, what? No, you build the psych chamber and then of course there would be some, some gerbil in some future somewhere that is able to communicate with you, right? Because there are like all kinds of different gerbils all over the place. And so it basically generates a quest for you where it's like, hey, I have this thing. And like, if you can get here with this specific stuff, then we can defeat the, the robots at this location. And so it's basically like a, a quest generation system. But you could also send out your own scouts, and then you would know, of course, what what breed and strain they were. And so you could you would be sure to be able to communicate with them. So, so try this on. If we have these self-replicating robots that are the, the, the rogue AI that's taking over the universe and turning into Grey Goo, oh. um, then we could also have the same self-replicating robots that are under the authority of the uh, gerbils. Mm-hmm. Which basically means if every gerbil is running around with their Pokeball of Grey Goo, and they, it's a 
the problem is just the information, like programming and thinking out and like trying to incorporate what actually to do. Then the only thing that has to be transferred across your gerbils is the information of what that scout ought to do with its um, with its gray goo in that moment. Because then what you have is you're like, uh, scout, find a thing, sends back a message. Okay, now we have our offset. We match the chamber. Now we receive the message. Cool. And walk step. Now we can move forward in time together. And it's like, okay, we're going to go. But I'm not sure why this has to be in lockstep. Why can't we just like have this scout here and he sends the message and then over here we have as much offset as we want and because we can communicate across time we can just send the message even farther back in time but the dribble doesn't care with instruction for what to do with your gray goo and we have a whole simulator we spin up a simulator of that guy's scenario we solve the problem with our uh we talked about platform ai generation where you like figure out the procedure yeah to defeat the system yeah. and then you send that back over to your scout and then he gets to make a run at taking over the planet or protecting this zone or whatever else. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, you could, uh, yeah, you could totally do that. I think that's, I think that's a great idea. My thought was that it wouldn't be so much a gray goo is more of like a, um, planetary annihilation kind of robot thing where it's very differentiated mm. and organized. Um, uh, so that, so that it would have, weak points more like a death star trench run kind of thing where it's like okay well i need three fighters with you know photon torpedoes here because i don't have that because i didn't bring any photon torpedoes and fighters with me right like i just i just brought myself i'm in this tiny little pod or whatever um and so then you'd build the fighters and photon torpedoes and like send them and you use up that that gap there and then like immediately after he sends the message the fighters arrive and it's like, Hey, perfect. And now they can make the trench run and blow up the death star or however it works. But if it was just a gray goose scenario, then yeah, you could, uh, you could do something where you like the scout captures the sample, analyzes it, sends the sample analysis back to the base. The base does this huge simulation and develops the anti, uh, design design for like the anti venom for the, the, uh, gray goo, and then sends that back to the scout and the scout is, you know, able to synthesize the anti-venom thing and like, you know, converts it all so that now it's all helping you instead of trying to destroy you. Right. Or something. Because that, that keeps the, it's the, then you're only sending information back and forth and you can kind of take your base and silo it basically mechanically from the rest of the, like the universe. You don't actually have to figure out the corridors in real space. You yeah. Can just have this kind of time and causality. Yeah. 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 True. I, I was, um, I was just preferring the, the other solution because it's more complex and more interesting to me, but yeah, you could just right. do it with, with just information where like you get the scout there, the scout has everything it needs, or, or maybe, maybe the scout, might have everything it needs to build whatever it needs, but because your information isn't perfect, like you don't know for sure. So you could send an expeditionary force and have the scout start building something. Uh, uh, right. But yeah, so, you should be able to, you should be able to advance the base without advancing the scout until they're, until you've used up that whole budget basically. Okay. So if offset. the scouts are in the future and they're sending yeah. back to the past, so the yeah. scout goes out and does the thing. And then as soon as it gets there, it sends a message back to the people. Can it send a message back to the base from before the scout leaves? No. That was... Uh... Yes? I don't know. Oh, I got it. I got it. Here we go. Yeah. You have to communicate across a very similar set of circumstances. Right. Scouts can only communicate with themselves. <laughs> but you can't, you can't actually mess with causality. So the scout, before they leave, they go sit in the chamber and they uh -huh. have one, they sit there for an hour or day or seven years. However or long. Else. Yeah. Yeah. They meditate for however long. 
and they, they're sending out encrypted information that they themselves don't understand. <laughs> okay. Then they go on their journey. Then you get a time budget based on how much time you allocated to communicate back in time to the scout before they left. Uh huh. And then during that period of time, depending on how much time budget you gave yourself, then you can away from the scout so you don't mess with causality chains, try and spin up the resources so when the scout leaves, they arrive with whatever they need. Right, right. Yeah, okay, so the scout can't be interfered with while they're in the chamber. So then all, any messages that you receive from the scout in the future, you only get access to at the end of whatever your meditation period is. So you can't do two-way, you can't do two-way communication. Or you can do two-way right. communication, but you can't communicate information after. But see, that would that would prevent you from communicating information after they left, unless you had multiple sessions and then you played them separately. No, I would I would say you can't communicate information after they left, except for the fact that they leave and they send information in the future, and they you don't actually when you're playing the scout. <laughs> You don't have to uh, use up your seven-day budget. Let's say he sits in the chamber for seven days, and then sending a message takes one day. You don't have to send all of your days consecutively. You like sit in your chamber, you send back a bunch of information, then you work with it's what's arrived, and then you and then you're like, okay, now I need this thing to happen, and now I send back information again, but because causality the gerbils have to be really careful about making sure that whatever they send to support the scout arrives after they've sent the message that they need it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we could just, I mean, you could hand wave it a little bit. It's like, if the thing arrives before, then we've messed the causality chain. And then like, I don't know, the whole right, thing right. explodes. Yeah. Well, everything. because, because the whole system is built with procedural tools, you could very easily make it so, like, you can try to send it so it arrives before you send the message, but something will go wrong. Or, and, you know, like, all these things will interfere with it so that actually it won't arrive before. Maybe it'll arrive significantly after if you try to send it to arrive before, right? Hey, guys, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do a thing. There's a dog in our house, though. That's not my fault. Can you shut the door, please? Thank you. Okay, we're back. I am just recording this, so we can edit all that out. Okay, I lost I lost audio conveniently right at this time, so this um, this works just fine. All right, are we back? Are we done? We probably are done. This has been an hour. Oh, that's true. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Woo! Okay, we'll be back with more gerbil journey and or speculation on. Because I, I like to take any game example and then try and move backwards towards, okay, what tool sets do we need? What modules would we need? How do those have to interact? And like try and step it backwards. Because I just, I mean, they're all the games are all the games. And yeah, I, a, I was talking about. The way with... in which you can do journal journey, it's really just every time you land, you play uplift. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, yeah, the, um, advice I got from Anna was like, stop talking to each other about it and start talking to the computer about it. And I was like, well, maybe, maybe someday until then we'll keep yeah. talking. about Okay. It. Well then next time we do this, I will have, uh, my laptop up with unity. Nice. And I will, um, be able to bang along the side. I also have unity so we can do something. 